Screencast 4, Introduction to Oligopolies. So we were here in Monopolist Competition, and now we're going to migrate over to our very last market model, Oligopolies. And again, these two in the middle, Monopolist Competition and Oligopolies, are most of the firms that you actually interact with in your daily life. So let's talk about what it means to be an oligopoly. First off, it's an industry that's dominated by a few large producers. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute. Um, but again, if you need some numbers, think an industry where something between two and 10 firms exists. Could be a little bit more, can't be less, um, but few large producers. Secondly, um, oligopolies might be industries where they're all selling exactly the same product. That's called a homogeneous oligopoly. Or they might be selling differentiated products, products that are slightly different. So in this sense, they could be like perfect competition that are all selling exactly the same thing. Or they could be like monopolies or monopolistic competition where they're selling a differentiated product. So maybe some examples would help. Um, the car industry, uh, Ford, GM, Toyota, that would be an example of a differentiated oligopoly. A few large firms dominate car production, and their cars are different. Um, airlines might be a differentiated oligopoly. Um, on one airline, you might get a nice warm towel. On another airline, you might get a free bag check-in. On another airline, you might, um, I don't know, get a video screen. Um, and other airlines, you might not. Uh, homogeneous oligopolies might be something like a steel company. Um, in America, there are a few large steel producers, and they're all producing pretty much the same thing, steel. Um, same thing might be true for the coal industry. A few large coal producers, and what they're producing, coal, is pretty much like anyone else's coal. Third characteristic, control over price, but mutual interdependence. And this is the important part about oligopolies. Since they have differentiated products, and there's uh, often, and since there's relatively few of them, they have a lot of control over their price. But what price they charge depends on not only the price that they're thinking about, but what everyone else is doing. That's what it means to be mutually interdependent. What happens to you is a function of your decisions, but also the de decisions that other people are making. So you can think about Titan as an example of a differentiated oligopoly. Um, in the Titan game, you're all selling kind of the same thing, hollow generators, but they're different. They have different features and different prices. And the price that you charge when you play the game isn't just a price that you're picking out of the air. You're thinking about, or should be thinking about, the price that other firms are charging, and you're kind of adjusting your price to that. That has implications, um, and specifically it has what are called game theory implications, and we're going to get into game theory in the next screencast. And then finally, the thing that's making it an oligopoly is that there's some barrier to entry. Now, it's not an absolute barrier to entry that we saw in monopolies that was making them the only firm in the industry. But there's something about these kind of industries that makes it hard for other firms to enter, which is why there's only a few large producers. So again, you might take the car industry as an example. There's a reason there's only 10 or so big car companies. It takes a lot of money to start a car company. And if I wanted to compete with Honda, it wouldn't be that easy for me to do that. I'd have to raise billions of dollars to start my own first car factory. All right, so it has barriers to entry, but not as absolute barriers as we saw in monopolies. So let's talk about what it means to have a few large producers. And at this point, we're going to do a little bit of math. Um, so if you don't have a calculator, you're going to want to go grab one, pause the video, uh, come back with the calculator so you can practice what it is you're going to have to do. Okay, so we're going to answer these questions. How do we know whether or not we're dealing with an oligopoly? How do we know if an industry is so concentrated that we need to worry about it um, and worry about that it's going to act badly like a monopoly? When we say an industry is concentrated, what we mean is that the power in that industry is focused into a few producers. That's what it means to be concentrated. So a monopoly is like perfectly concentrated, like one company has all the power. Perfect competition was not concentrated at all. We had thousands of firms, each with little or no power. With oligopolies, we have some degree of concentration because we have relatively few firms, 
And whether we worry about that or not kind of depends on how dominated the industry is by a few big firms. Is it really, really dominated or is the power kind of more spread out throughout the industry? Well, there are two methods to figuring out how much we should be worried about an oligopoly, how concentrated it is or how much it's going to act like a monopoly, how much power these few firms are going to have. The first method is called the four firm concentration ratio, which you're going to need to know how to calculate. And the second method is called the Herfindahl index, which is an unfortunate name, but um, problematically the guy that invented it was named Herfindahl, and we're going to have to go with that name. All right, so let's start out with the four firm concentration ratio. The way you figure out the four firm concentration ratio is by finding the largest four firms in any industry by their percentage market share, adding up those percentages, and then comparing them to the number 80, which is kind of this arbitrary cutoff that government regulators and economists have come up with as kind of being like the red line at which point we start getting worried about an industry that it's too concentrated and that firms are going to start acting like monopolies um, with all those negative societal effects. All right, so I want you to imagine two industries and each of those industries has eight firms in it. Industry number one and industry number two. Um, I've simply called these company names A through H and what you can see in each of these little tables is each firm and their percentage market share. What percentage of all the products in their industry they produce and sell. So you have two different industries here, each with eight firms, and you'll notice that the market shares are different. If you add them all up for the industries, they should add up to 100% because all the firms together have to be selling 100% of the product. All right, so to figure out the four firm concentration ratio, you find the four largest firms in each industry. I've highlighted them in purple here. You add up their market shares. So in industry number one, it would be 40 plus 20 plus 15 plus 15. <clears throat> in industry number two, it would be 15 plus 15 plus 15 plus 15. And that gives you their concentration ratios. In industry number one, uh, as soon as that little thing goes away, there we go. We have a four firm concentration ratio of 90%. What that means is that the top four firms are selling 90% of all the goods that are sold in that industry. That's greater than 80%, and so that's an industry that government regulators would be worried about. It's not a monopoly, but it's going to look a lot like a monopoly because those firms have a lot of power. In the, in the industry on the right, industry number two, when we add those two up, we get 60%, which falls below our 80% threshold. So it's going to be less competitive than a perfectly competitive industry, less competitive than monopolistic competition, but we're a little bit less worried that these, these firms are going to dominate the industry and just start doing all sorts of terrible things like a monopolist would do. All right, now one problem with the four firm concentration ratio is that it could be deceptive. So I'm going to give you two more industries here, um, and you might want to pause the video and see if you can figure out what the four firm concentration ratios are for each of these two industries. Pause. Unpause. All right, there's the answer. You'll notice that in each of these two industries, the four firm concentration ratio is equal to 80%. But if you look at the industries closely, you'll notice that we have the same concentration ratio but industry number one looks a lot more concentrated than industry number two. In industry number one, we have this one firm that's kind of dominating the whole industry. This would be an industry that may not be a monopoly, but it's starting to look a lot like a monopoly. In industry number two, these four firms are still dominating, but you'll notice that the power is a little bit more spread out. Each firm only has 20% of, of the market share for those top firms. Um, as a result of the fact that the four firm concentration ratio can be deceptive, this guy named Herfindahl came up with what is called the Herfindahl index, which is kind of another measure of, of concentration that kind of avoids this problem. So the way you calculate a Herfindahl index is by adding up the sum of the squares of the market shares of every single firm in the industry, not just the top four, every single firm. You're going to get a number when you do that, and we're going to compare that number to a certain range. 
As that number gets lower, as it starts to approach zero, it means that the industry isn't very concentrated. And we don't have to worry about um, that industry acting like a monopolist or doing monopolist type things. The top end of the range is 10,000. And the closer we get to 10,000, the more the, the industry looks like a monopoly and the more government regulators and economists worry about it. Now, unlike at the poor firm concentration ratio, there's no magic cutoff number like 80%. There's no number for the Herfindahl index where we say, yep, we definitely worry, or no, we definitely don't. Um, it's just another metric that you can use to kind of get a sense of the relative concentration between industries. All right, so let's take an example. Let's say we have an industry that looks like this, eight firms, each with various market shares. To calculate the Herfindahl index, again, we take the sum of the squares of every single firm in the industry. So we would take this 40 and square it. We'd add to that 20 squared plus 15 squared plus 15 squared plus 5 squared plus 3 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. Add them all together and you get a Herfindahl index. In this example, it would be 2,486. In terms of that range between 0 and 10,000, it's towards, sort of towards the bottom end of that range, right, less than halfway up. So this might not be an industry that we'd worry about too much. Now to show you why the Herfindahl index is useful, I want to go back to that example that we um, were looking at a, um, a little while ago, where we had two different industries, each with a four firm concentration ratio equal to 80%, but the industries looked a little bit different. Remember, industry number one looked a little bit more concentrated than industry number two. In fact, might, now might be a good time to practice whether you can calculate a uh, Herfindahl index. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video for a second and see if you can calculate the Herfindahl index for industry number one and do the same thing for industry number two. Pause. Do, 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 do. Unpause. Do, 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 do. Did you get those numbers? I'm hoping you did because I'm hoping that I got the right numbers and that they match up with your numbers. And you'll notice that the Herfindahl index for industry number one is significantly higher than it is for industry number two. In other words, the four firm concentration ratio was giving us just a general snapshot of what the industry looked like. But again, it was looking a little bit deceptive because we were getting the same 80% for each industry. The Herfindahl index is kind of like a way to fine tune that first measure that we used uh, with the four firm concentration ratio to really distinguish between industries and see which ones are more concentrated and which ones are really less. All right, so finally, I want to just clarify why we have a range of 0 to 10,000 in dealing with the Herfindahl index. So imagine two industries. Let's say that industry number one is actually a monopoly. And what that would mean is that it had 100% market share. That's about as, as concentrated as you can get, right? You can't get any more concentrated. Industry number two, I want you to imagine, is perfectly competitive. Let's say that there are 100 firms in that industry, and each one's only selling 1% of all the goods and services, has a 1% market share. Take a second and see if you can calculate the Herfindahl index for those two industries. When you calculate the Herfindahl index for the first industry, it would be 100 squared, right? The sum of the squares of every firm in that industry. And 100 squared is equal to 10,000. That's the most concentration possible. And that's why 10,000 defines the top of our range. The most concentration possible is essentially a monopoly. Now for industry number two, you would take the sum of the squares of every firm in the industry. So that would be 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared 100 times, which would give you a Herfindahl index of 100. Here we're getting close to 0. Um, and a perfectly competitive firm probably wouldn't actually even have 100 firms. It would probably have maybe 10,000 firms, each with 1 10,000th of uh, the market share. And that number would actually get even lower and actually would start to approach 0. So you can kind of understand why we have this 0 to 10,000 range. Numbers close to 0 start looking a lot like perfect competition. 10,000 looks a lot like a monopoly. And so the higher we get towards that 10,000 number, the more that oligopoly 
It's going to look like, act like, sound like, and yes, even smell like a monopoly. All right. Um, that's it for the first part of Vologopolis, and next time we talk about game theory, which I'm pretty into. Stan? Stan? Hang on, guys. My dad wants something. Stan! What? You've been on your computer all weekend. Shouldn't you go out and socialize with your friends? I am socializing, Artard. I'm logged on to an MMORPG with people from all over the world and getting XP with my party using TeamSpeak.